how to be an optimist about climate change. Right? Okay. Two summers ago, I got on a bike with some family members. We rode from sea level up 12,000 feet to the peak of Mauna Loa. And you know, I wanted to see this observatory where for the last almost 70 years, since 1958, atmospheric CO2 has been measured. Right? And so what struck me is that you, know, you have this stark beauty, this beautiful landscape. You know, we live on this beautiful planet, but here also is where we measure the CO2 rise that is causing our uh, climate change uh, uh, issues. Right? Very same location. And of course, here's that data. right? And so uh, this tells the story of the crisis we're in, but in every crisis, you know, there's opportunity. And so it's easy when you listen to talks about climate uh, to feel gloom and doom. Right? But you know, I think humans do their best work when there's a sense of optimism where there's joy. And so I want to try to uh, tell you and illustrate to you where some of that optimism comes from for technologists like me today. Right? So you know, we have enough human talent on the planet uh, to tackle uh, so many of these problems. And so just within the last 12 months, out of my lab here at MIT, we have spun out three new uh, startups working in climate tech. And so the 10x is the rate of technological innovation. We need everything else around it. We need policy, we need economics. But you know, what I want to emphasize is that this rate of innovation is what's accelerating. Okay. OK, so uh, you know, and saying that, I don't want to underestimate at all the size of the challenge that we're facing. You know, we're not, uh, we can't approach this with our head in the sand. We can't be you know, rearranging deck chairs on the Titanic. But you know, what is it that you can do? Well, you can get your hands dirty and uh, really uh, start to work on these problems. All right, so one of the problems we have to tackle is industrial decarbonization if we're going to get to net, uh, to net zero. All right, so let's break this down a little bit. These are the big four. These together are half of all industrial emissions. And if we just take cement, that's 8% of all global emissions. But what I want you to notice here are the dates. These are the key invention dates. Right, so these technologies were invented 100 to 200 years ago. Right? Now, imagine that you're a person like me or a student at MIT, and uh, someone comes to you and says, you know, here's this 100-year-old technology. It was literally a building block of modern society. And now, we want you to reinvent it. Right? We want you to reinvent it, not just to decarbonize, to make it better. And make it more energy efficient, make it lower costs. Now, that's exciting. You know, that's worth getting out of bed in the morning. Right? So those are the kinds of things that we're facing today, and you know, that's part of what gives us optimism. So let me dig into one of these, Portland Cement. Take a look at this patent from 1824, and it talks about making an artificial stone. You're surrounded by that artificial stone. Just look around you. Right? That's right below your feet. And so uh, what happened was that you know, four years ago, uh, having become aware of the huge carbon footprint of cement production, we started out to try to invent an alternative. Right? And we wanted something that would use renewable electricity instead of heat, replace all those coal-fired uh, furnaces that you see here. And the inspiration was something that looks like this. This is an electrolyzer splitting water but what I want to emphasize here is not the fact that you're making hydrogen and oxygen from this electrolyzer. The color is a pH indicator. And it tells you that at the same time, you're producing an acid and a base. So the basic idea was that let's use an electrolyzer not to produce hydrogen and oxygen, but to produce acid and bases for materials processing. Now, I submit that if you have acids and you have bases, you can take rock. You can decompose it with acid, precipitate it with base, and reassemble that artificial stone that we're after. Right? So that's the basic idea. And uh, what's happened? Right? Again, uh, it just took us four years to get to this point. This is a decarbonized alternative to Portland Cement, our first field pours starting January of 2024. And what you see here is that we have a form fit function replacement for the Portland cement that we've been using for the last 200 years. Okay. 
What this shows is that the technology works. The challenge now is scaling. And we need to scale massively, and we need to do it with the help of the cement majors in the world. The startups are getting it started. Uh, we need the partnerships with the cement majors, companies like Wholesome, companies like Semex, to really get to where we need to go. Okay. okay. There was an unintended consequence of that work, uh, but in a good way. While we're looking at how to decompose stone and reassemble it into artificial stone, well, we figured out that there's another stone. It's the source of most of the lithium in the world today. Hard rock, a mineral called spodumene. And what we found is that the work we did on cement led to a way to, with zero waste, take that spodumene, that lithium uh, mineral, and extract the lithium for our lithium-ion batteries while also taking everything else and producing a useful product, and therefore zero waste mining. Okay. okay. And so uh, this, the goal of this work is to allow us to source lithium much more broadly than we, today, than we do today. Today we do it primarily with brines from South America. And so we have this hard rock in the United States, Australia, Portugal, many other places in the world. Right? And we think we can do it at cost parity with the brines that are being uh, processed today. Right? So one innovation leads to another, often in unexpected ways. All right, I'm going to tell you a story about batteries and about iron and about rusting. Right? You know, this is the iron air battery. Right? It operates on a principle called reversible rusting. What does that mean? You know, if you have iron, you have water, you have oxygen, you get rust. Right? You've all seen it. Turns out that if you're clever, you can take that rusting process, and you know that it's energetically downhill because it occurs spontaneously. And you can get electrons out of it, and that's an iron-air battery. Okay? So you take the rusting process, and you get electricity. You know, why iron? Well, you know, iron is the most plentiful metal on the planet. It's the lowest-cost metal. Okay? It's on every continent. We today harvest and produce 40 times more iron than the next most plentiful metal, which is aluminum. Okay? And so there are all kinds of reasons to use iron air batteries. But what this battery will do for you okay, is to store affordably electricity over multiple days. And it can turn renewable energy into reliable energy. That's the key. So the next time you have a polar vortex event, okay, uh, cloudy for several days, the wind dies for several days, there won't be an excuse not to use renewable energy. That's the purpose of this battery. Okay. All right, how does this get to scale? Weirton, West Virginia was once the center of much of the US's steel production. Okay. This is 1962. At one time, this one site, this steel mill, produced roughly half of the US's uh, steel. Okay. And when we arrived just a little over a year ago, this is what it looked like empty field. And I noticed that there were three silos there. And you know, being in this area, I said, oh, I, I know what three silos means. Three silos means iron ore, coal, and limestone. That was the site of the last blast furnace on this site. Okay? And all that went away uh, several decades ago. What we've built over just the last 18 months is a gigafactory to produce those iron ore batteries I was just telling you about. This is a million square feet. Okay. And this has uh, just been commissioned. And it, this produces 50 gigawatt hours of battery. Well, what does that mean? Well, it's the same size as one of our lithium ion gigafactories that we have in the world today. And it's just the first of many that are going to be coming along. Right. OK, one innovation leads to another. Let me tell you about the reversible part of this reversible rusting. I said, you know, when it rusts, we get electricity out with discharging a battery. Turns out that to charge this rechargeable battery, we put electricity in. We take that rust and turn it back into metallic iron. Yeah, this was shown on the right-hand side here. It turns out that that starts to look a lot like green steel making, because the iron ore we get out of the ground is basically rust. And now we start to think about the ability to use renewable electricity to take iron ore in a decarbonized way to iron. And maybe to produce a new way 
uh, to make steel sustainably and in a missionless uh, manner. So this pursuit, we're trying to make the lowest cost battery on Earth using the most abundant metal on Earth, and we just might be able to flip that on its head and give us a way to produce steel, the second largest industrial emitter uh, on the Earth today. Okay. So we're doing this in West Virginia, and West Virginia is a state that calls itself the land of broken promises. Okay? We've made a promise uh, that we intend to keep. You know, in exchange for very generous support from the state of West Virginia, you know, what our job is, is to deliver 750 jobs to Weirton uh, over the next several years. Where else can we innovate in, where, uh, in this uh, you know, climate ecosystem? You know, I've spent the last couple of years visiting a lot of mines, and this is Bingham Canyon. Well, you know, mining is a lot like cement, a lot like steel, a lot like batteries. You have, kind of have this love-hate relationship with it. Right? You see these you know, giant plants. You know, I mean, and you know, who actually loves their battery? You know, the battery is never good enough, right? <laughs> love-hate relationship, right? But you know, this energy transition is going to take a lot of copper. Right? Electrification is going to take a lot of copper. And we have to get that copper from somewhere. This is one of the two largest mines in the US today. But we can't get more than 20% of our copper domestically today. The rest is imported. And the reason is because taking copper ore to copper metal involves a process called smelting. And smelting and coal power plants invented acid rain. Okay? It's not nearly the problem today that it used to be. But smelters also emit toxic metals in the plumes. And so the barrier is that in the US today, we cannot permit a new smelter. So what are we going to do? Are we going to ship this all offshore? We're we going to do all that polluting somewhere else? No, that's not acceptable. Right? So this leads to the question, can you invent, can we invent emissionless smelting? Right? So I have some ideas there. You know, we should talk about that. Okay? All right, one last one. Uh, this is Berkeley Pit. So if this were Jeopardy, the answer to the question, what is Berkeley Pit, is not a dive bar on Telegraph Avenue. <laughs> OK? <laughs> Berkeley Pit is a pit mine also producing copper, which when the copper was exhausted, the groundwater started to refill. And it looks beautiful. But it's a super fun site. Okay? The water leaching the surrounding geography has produced a half a cubic mile of acidic water, so low in pH that when birds land on it, they die. Okay? So you would be right to think of this as you know, an, the environmental disaster that it is. But you know, if you're taking a solutionist mindset, uh, like, you know, we're trying to do. You look at this and you say, well, you know, look what didn't need to be smelted. You know, how much metal is dissolved in that, you know, pH 4 water that I can go after in a way that doesn't produce smelting? So that's an example of how we can think about these problems and, uh, you know, one innovation again leads to another. Okay, so a little bit of historical perspective on climate change and technology. The climatologists have been telling, this, telling us that there's a problem for decades. But honestly, if you look back, the words climate change didn't start to be used widely until the late 2000s. My personal perspective is that you know, we, the engineering community, actually took some time to figure out what it is that we could do. It took us about a decade to figure out really where the best places to apply what we know. Right? And so that was the last decade. But in this decade, this decade is where the innovation is really picking up 10x. Right? And so uh, that's why I'm optimistic about our chances for really coming up with all the fixes we need for climate change. And I hope that you will be too. Right? Thank you. Thank you.